projects I'm going to talk about is uh, Greenfield project, but it's a, it's not a startup. Uh, Contal has been around for 35 years, and our vision is to systemize the world of aquaculture and fisheries. So we cover all what we call commercial species, uh, and so salmon, shrimp, sea bass, and everything, and um, we cover the whole value chain. So from for salmon uh, farming, for instance, it's from the salmon fry to uh, to the grow out to treatments, harvest, slaughter, processing, retail, and consumption. And you might think that you know in a fairly regulated industry like the salmon farming industry, it's kind of you suspect the data to be like this. It's more like this. So. Uh, that's kind of what analysis is all about. So we are a seafood analytics company. Uh, so we get a lot of garbage in, so magic happens, and then gospel comes out. So since we've been doing this for now 35 years, we have a lot of, well, we've been drilling for seafood data for 35 years. And we now have the most complete privately owned collection of seafood data in the world. But it's only for the uh, last year or so that we kind of had a technology focus. So before that, it was just some seafood experts and enthusiasts that really know everything there is to know about seafood, uh, but not so much about technology. So this is what they know. Uh, and then I learned this, unfortunately. And uh, that was quite pretty much the tech stack for the first 25 30 years uh, before they found this. Uh, mostly because the uh, limit on an access database is two gigabytes, so they needed to do something. And so when I joined in May last year, this is kind of the tech stack. So it had like 60,000 Excel files. And it's not like a simple Excel file either. It's like hundreds of sheets within each Excel file linked to a dozen other Excel files and so on. So a lot of data mm, and some access databases and, and some SQL. And this was the mission we were given. So what's a scalable technology platform or what's a data platform? Because that's really what we were going to build here. Let's um, take the boring answer first. Because uh, it, it depends. Uh, a data platform comes in many many, many flavors. So, And it's not that it's the lack of options. Um, so when you're going to build a data platform, you know, uh, how many of these do you need? Which one do you pick? And so on. It's, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. But if you step back uh, a bit and see more on the kind of what are the different high-level uh, types of data platforms out there, you can start with the data warehouse, which has been around since the 80s, um, where you kind of have some text data, transform it, load it into some structured database called the data warehouse. And it's not like a relational data. It could be a part of a relational database, but the schema is typically more optimized for reporting. That's kind of what you, what you need the data warehouse for. That's kind of what it's built for. So you have more kind of a star scheme and that kind of uh, structure on the data models. And if those data warehouses grow too big, you might want to split them down into kind of more domain-specific data warehouses called marts. Uh, but then uh, what if you don't just have the uh, text data? You want to have, have some videos, you want to have some some uh, some mu music or some some other uh, binary format coming in. Uh, you have large amounts of data. You have some uh, sensor uh, data from IoT or something. This then the data warehouse is kind of the the fit there. You need something that's where it's kind of cheap to store large amounts of data, and then that's where the data lake came in. And it's kind of because you had all this cheap storage, blob storage solution in the cloud. They kind of switch around the, the ETL part. So you do the, the uh, get the data in and just dump the raw data in the blob storage. And then you do the uh, transformation. And the typical usage here is more 
uh, more advanced, you can say, so more to be a data scientist sitting creating some, some machine learning models or something. And you can, of course, combine those two. So you can have a data lake with the, and then put on a data warehouse for the reporting stuff. And that's where we have seen some innovation in the last uh, couple of years. It's uh, these data lake houses, which is just you know, a data lake with some layer on top where you can do the transformations and metadata handling and uh, also structure for the uh, for, uh, reporting side. And the point here is that you know, one is not better than the other. <laughs> they suit different purposes. So you know, uh, I'm not saying that you should use Data Lake or you should like, it just all depends on what your, what your goal is. So kind of depending on what gospel you're singing to write here, <laughs> you need to figure out the magic in the, in the middle. So the Contale data platform. So we work on seafood data. And so take it back to kind of the <laughs> aquaculture uh, metaphors here. We, we have kind of the same problem space to solve as you've seen, uh, seen here. We need to harvest the data. We need to clean it, transform it, store it. Then we can analyze it and then distribute it and then present it to our customers so they can consume it. So you can, you know, Putting that into a more technology perspective or context, uh, you can see that we have kind of these ETL parts. We have the modeling stuff with our uh, predictive models and estimations and all that stuff. And then we need to distribute it via the API, either directly to the customer or out through our uh, web application where the customer can consume it. So we take in the sources, we store them in a uh, raw, uh, Raw, f raw files stored in uh, some blob storage. And then we, since 90% of data we work on is time series. So we have a relational database where we put it in, not a data warehouse, it's just a relational database. Um, but it's structured you know, for our needs. Uh, and then we can uh, get that out to our portal or a product called Edge. And then the uh, data scientists can work on those time series, do their prediction models and all that stuff, and then add it back to the database. So as we worked on uh, uh, kind of when you split it into those different components, it's a bit easier to kind of zoom in on some of these parts of this uh, map and, and see, OK, what is it that we actually need here? And what is it that we want some tooling around? And even though we can assume in on, well, let's say, orchestration in this part, it's still a lot of options. Uh, it's not even all of them there. But, but it's kind of how do we choose a tech within that space? So, so I'm not going to tell you how you're going to do it, but I'm going to tell you how we do it. And for us, it's the, uh, the team decision. It might be a, a kind of a boring answer or so, but, but everybody's talking about team autonomy, right? So what does that actually mean? Uh, so before we do that decision, we have kind of some, some rules. So we, uh, we say that we want to build before we buy, which means that we want to test out stuff and try and build it ourselves and see where is it that we really need some tooling and what do we not want to build ourselves. So for the ETL parts, it could be the orchestration, like the, the scheduling, when does the different extraction run. Uh, it could be the monitoring. It could be the how do you look at the logs and so on. But building those prototypes, you know, taking like three, four, or five of those ETLs, build them up by hand and see, OK, this is, we're not going to spend time building a scheduler. That's not our core uh, expertise. That's not what we're going to spend our time in. So. But doing all those prototypes, you know, it can be quick and dirty. And, and then it wasn't nice. It wasn't beautiful code. It wasn't fast in any way. But we learned a lot. And enough to kind of when we then sat down and wanted to, to choose one of these uh, frameworks, we had enough to kind of, OK, this is what's important for us. We're going to arrange them according to these are the things that we need to look at. And if that's all even, OK, these are the should-haves and so on. And when it came 
to actually picking one. Uh, we did a full day hackathon on, on this specific tooling. And uh, some preparation before that day, but we, we had three, three options that we want to explore when we came into this, uh, this day. So it was the Apache Beam, uh, the Prefect, and the Apache Airflow. And then we split, at this time, it was uh, six people on the team. So, so we split into three pairs. And uh, the first step was just to create a hello world with the different ones, you know, follow the getting started guidelines on them and getting them up and running. And then we switched around so that those two or the pair working on Apache Beam started on the airflow. We did a demo and a handover, so they kind of started where the last pair left off. And then tried to build something more, more advanced. So b getting up a pipeline, how do we run it? How do we monitor it? How, what, how do we see the logs and so on? And uh, then we switch again. So every pair had to try all three options. And uh, then it was time to build a more advanced pipeline like uh, with branches and dependencies and all that good stuff. And, uh, but actually, before we got there, we already found that Apache Beam was not going to be a good, good solution for us. So we kind of regrouped. And it's not that Apache Beam is a bad product in any way. It's a really good product, but not for us. Uh, so is then we had like two options left, and then we did some more uh, testing on that. Tried some some more advanced pipelines and uh, took a demo, some discussions, and it was time to. Everyone involved here had one vote each, and it's like, which one do you prefer? And in this case, actually everyone wanted the airflow, so that was kind of. Easy this decision. Well, we did the same things on the front end framework, except we didn't build a framework first. Uh, kind of knew that was something we want to have. But it was the same. At that time, it was only three developers, so they picked each one, one, uh, one framework each. Uh, this we had some more time on this one, so we spent one day on each framework, really getting into you know what's what's the good things, what's the bad things, and then. At this was a bit, uh, at the end of this, it was kind of, you know, it didn't feel really good with any of them. Like, they were good, but, you know. So, on the last day, one of the guys had some spare time, so he, he wanted to try Svelte, and it ended up, you know, this was so, everyone liked it so well, so, okay, that's the one we ended up with. But it was all the, the team making that decision. So we did this with the, with the airflow and Svelte. Uh, some of the things is kind of there wasn't any discussions. It's like okay, we you know, we we're just gonna use this. Everyone know this. Know this. Smallers, we did some similar things like which cloud provider to run the, the Kubernetes on. Uh, what do we use for uh, infrastructure as code? What chart library do we use? That's kind of we did the same same process there. Uh, and uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that the the it's not, not me as a CTO or a most senior one on the team making those decisions. It's, it's the whole team. And when you get that buy-in from the team, it's, it's, get, it's, it's more commitment on getting that to work. You know, they picked it. I'm going to make this work. And that's, a lot, that's what we mean with the team autonomy here. It's not one on the team picking it and then everybody have to follow along. It's that the team as a whole needs to do that decision. We also have uh, some other rules. We want to do the decisions as late as possible. So we, during this time period, we also build up the team. So adding more, more people to the team will add more competence to the team, or hopefully. <laughs> In our case, it did. So, uh, so lucky for us. Uh, so that means you have more knowledge on the team when you do the decisions, when you kind of try to postpone it as late as you can. And you also know more uh, as late as possible. And you have a third rule, which is you want to avoid lock-in. And how do you, it's easy to say, but uh, we always start with the exit strategy. So when we pick something, uh, we always try to figure out how do we get away from this. If this something new comes up that we want to try instead or it, we hit the wall or something. So we always start with the exit strategy. 
And then there's the exception to rules. So I said we're going to build before buy, but sometimes we're going to buy before build as well. Uh, so for instance, we didn't want to manage a database. So we went for a managed Postgres database that happens to have a blob storage as well. So good choice. Uh, for front end hosting, just get things up quick and easy on the web front end, we chose Vercel. I think it took me two minutes to get the <laughs> Swift application up and running. One and a half was just waiting for a build. Uh, and then Auth0 for authentication and authorization. We had some, uh, at the beginning, we just had some Docker, Docker components or Docker files. Uh, so we didn't have Kubernetes in the beginning. So just, you know, how do we get that services, those services quickly up and running? It's Google Cloud Run. Point at the image and it's up and running. There's no orchestration or anything of that. But it's a quick, quick and easy solution to, to get into it. But then we get to Kubernetes and then we could exit from the uh, Cloud Run because it had some, some limitations. And with the uh, Kubernetes up and running, we could move the front end into the cluster. Um, we now have moved the authorization part into the platform while still using the authentication of Auth0. So, so it's kind of sometimes you want to build first some things. You want to just want to quick up and running. But again, with the exit strategy in mind. So, But who's going to build this? So you need the right people for the job as well. And, and building a data platform is you need some different skills for the different things you want to do here. So. Since I started May last year, recruitment has been a real challenge. Uh, I also live in a quite little city. Kristiansund is 25,000 inhabitants, so getting some tech people there is even harder. But we managed to get it do something right. So, uh, and, and I want to do some just quick tips on that because job ads is really important to get. Use a lot of time on that. Get those really good because you want to make a good impression. You want to set some expectations on those what you want to uh, apply on the job. And you want to set some expectations on them as well. So you want to have the right people applying for a job. So this is for the data scientist position because we also have an office in The Hague. So we, we just hired a, a data scientist there. So. So we had this one out for one month in a, in a Dutch job ad space. Anyone want to guess how many applicants we got? No. A lot. And it, it shows that if you, if you get the, the uh, job ads right, you get something that kind of spikes an interest and you get the right people to search. It's the problem isn't that you haven't enough applicants. It's, you know, getting the right ones in the, in the large crowd. But that's a better problem than not having anyone. So, But then again, in one tip on the um, job bat, because there's some scientific uh, research, or research on what you shouldn't do. So do not put bullet points in your job ads. Never. Because uh, research uh, shows that if you do that, you will get more male applicants and very few women are uh, going to apply for that. Because for some reason, women want to check all the bullet points before they apply for a job, while we men are more like, I, I know that one. I'm going to apply for that. So one out of five, no problem. The rest I can learn on the job. So do not use bullet points. Uh, so uh, and when we do, we want to have the right people. Uh, so we are really. When we do the interviews, so we picked out seven candidates, and we do three rounds of interviews. So the first initial one is just to find out what kind of person is this? What's the personality? Is it someone who's going to fit into that culture that we want to build in the team? And then, if that's OK, then we go, go on to the technical interviews to find out, OK, do they know the stuff that we are asking for? And, and not only that, we, we want to know how do they solve this? How do they think? And how do they present their findings? How do they explain their code? That's what we want to have. And then we uh, do the last final round with you know, 
are we really sure both parties here that this is the right thing? So we end up uh, with one, one hiring now starting in, in January. And then it's this kind of the small things, uh, getting people on a good start. You know, I think everyone kind of appreciates that this is your first day on the job and it looks like this. This is what, you know, this is the gear. This is everything you have. You kind of feel that someone's had that extra little thought about, you know, you want to get on a good foot here. And everyone heard about the 10x developer. If not, it's, it's this, uh, I guess it's supposed to be kind of a positive thing. Uh, someone explaining that someone's really good, uh, more productive than, than someone else. I hate it. I, I hate the 10x developer because what does that really mean? You compare the 10x to the first person on the team. So, so what's the 1x here? Uh, that's not a good. That's not a good culture to have on a team. To have one so good and someone not so good. So it could be that someone's really good at some some areas, but then that job of that person is to lift the rest up to a better vers version of themselves. So you you wouldn't have that 10x. And when you look at all the competence that you need for, for this, you know, it's, it's a lot of things to know, and there's no way no one can be a 10x at everything here. So you really want to have some, some 10x or someone who's really good at some of this, and then you need to find some people that fill in the gaps. That's kind of what the right people uh, in the right... You need to have kind of the, the team's competence need to cover what you're, you're uh, looking for. And, and this is even half of it, right? You need the, the architectural design patterns, you need the, the testing strategies, you need to know the yeah, security stuff. There's so much thing you need to, to know on the team, but everyone doesn't have to know everything. So we don't want the 10x, we want the 10x team. And, uh, and I mean, it's not 10x compared to another team, but you want all those kind of high level, really good people in different areas that together can form that uh, really productive, good team. So, as I said, we started in May last year, so then uh, there was no one on the team. Uh, in 22, we were eight people, and then uh, January next year will be 14, or actually 15, there's one part time as well. And it's not just about the right people, it's about the right order of people. So we want to have the, when we hire people or we want to have uh, a new set of skills like data engineers, you want to start with the senior. You want to have the senior first, then you can add some. The next one's not that important. It could be a senior, it could be a less senior. But if you have the senior first, it's a lot easier to, to get the next one. But if you start with a kind of a junior first, you need that senior on the next one, right? And as you can see, I'm a big fan of even numbers. Uh, so, and the reason is that I, I don't want people to work alone. Uh, so when we hired our first data engineer, we already had the process laid up to get the second one in. When we heard, hired the first data scientist, we already started working on getting the second one in. We now have the first data scientist in Hague coming in January. Now we started planning to get the second one in. I want those pairs. Because that's a lot easier to, to work on. You have that you know, competence across the team. Uh, you can pair up different people, but you can always work more than one uh, at the same time. So start with one and plan for two. It's kind of a, a team there. And, and where does those different roles fit in? So the data engineers mainly work on the ETL parts, mainly, because they also work on other stuff, right? But that's kind of the main focus. And then you have the data scientists on the modeling stuff, and then you have the backend and front-end devs working on, on, well, really all over the place, but mainly on the front-end and, and the back-end, right? And then the thing about building a new team is that since Contale has been around for 35 years, but they never had a tech department. It was kind of a, a, a good position to be in because you can, 
decide what kind of culture you wanted within that new team. There wasn't any culture there. It wasn't any team before, so so um, so you need to set kind of okay. Well how do we want this team to be? Uh, and so we kind of had some 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 rules and meetings are are, are kind of a big part of setting a culture. So we want to have as few of them as possible. Uh, uh, doesn't mean we don't have meetings, but it's more you know we do them as we need. And we always try to schedule them for 25 or 50 minutes, so you have a little bit of gap in case you have kind of back-to-back -back meetings. There's at least some time for coffees. And the last one, that leaving is absolutely allowed. Is if you don't feel that you're spending your time in the best way in this meeting, leave, please. And then we do one-on-ones. So um, I had kind of a bad experience in my, my previous job where I was a team lead and uh, suddenly one left the team and I I wasn't aware that he was going to leave. I, I did not kind of, well, it was in a kind of a remote setting. It was in the COVID days, right? So, uh, so it was hard to have that kind of talks and all that. But, but I should have kind of one of the learnings after that was these are the signals I need to pick up, right? I need to know when someone's about to leave or someone's not happy. So. We started doing one-on-ones, so that means I talk to everyone on the team on a weekly or bi-weekly schedule, and it's all about the feedback. I want to know how I do on my job, because I haven't been CTO before. This is new for me as well. I need to learn. Am I doing a good job? And I need to tell them in a sit-down that, okay, I think you're doing this really well, but I think you can do better on this part. But it's always, you know, it's not my meeting. They can bring up whatever they want, and uh, we do it regularly. And we have some, some rules on the team as well, you know, yeah, there's, there's some do's and don'ts, so always learn, uh, that's part of the game, and you need to experiment a lot, as I said, that's, that's how we do things, that's how we learn new things, is trying out, building a lot of prototypes, testing out stuff, and always praise each other, it's always fun to get praised, you know, feel like you do a good job, but then you need to, to give some to get some, right? And never blame others, you know, take take responsibility for, for the code and, and it's everyone's code, so. And of course, the last one is kind of one of the things that uh, can get you fired, that's, that's, uh, that's a no-go, but should be that for everyone. And okay, what about those six months? So I said we started out in January, <laughs> and we launched in on October 5th. Not six months, right? <laughs> but some creative maths here. So we'll get there. So it's nine calendar months that we can agree on, but then it's summer, right? So June, June, that's, that doesn't count. <laughs> and Norway, so Norwegian May, that's a lot of holidays. And Easter is a lot of holidays. That's two weeks. And there's always someone li sick, so they take away a week there. Ah, six months. Hey! So we launched um, an MVP, uh, the minimum viable product. So that what is the kind of the low hanging fruit, or what's the minimum we could build now and get some feedback from the customers? So, so this is what we launched. And we're now, I think, almost 100 customers now on, on trial and starting to convert them to paying customer uh, next week. So that's, well, that's when we actually know where, <laughs> if this was a good one, right? It's a free trial, it's, yeah. But when they have to pay for it, uh, then you really get some good feedback. So, but we're gonna, of course, gonna make it better and um, add some more content, but. So, our heroes, yeah, we say so. It's a really good team. We launched nine months ahead of schedule. Uh, it was according to the strategy laid back in 2020. This product's gonna be uh, live in before summer next year. So, and the team is just amazingly good. It's the best team I've ever worked on because they, they have this competence that feel it each other and they kind of support each other. It's it's really good spirit on the team. So I, I think we are, yeah, I think we are heroes. So summary, uh, as I said, kind of 
choosing a technology is never easy. But if you start with an exit strategy, you can always change your mind, right? So let's always start with exit strategy. How do you get away from things? And team decision means team decision. It's not one on the team making the decision for the team. It's the team making it together. So democratize those processes. And then it's all about having the right people at the right time uh, joining in. And then it's where the recruitment parts get in. It's I spent probably 20% of my time since I started just doing recruiting. It's a really hard job, but it's worth it. Cause you and I've said I've turned down a lot of candidates. Cause not because they wasn't technical enough or good enough on the technical, but they didn't fit into the team. They didn't kind of build up the support or the culture that we wanted in that team. As I said, I, I want people with, with strong opinions, weekly health. So they can be really, you know, this is the thing we should do because of this. But if someone has better uh, alternatives or can convince them that this is a better option, then you should fall back on that. You know, you shouldn't keep it just because you, that was the first thing you thought of. Because culture, that's what makes the, the strong team. It's not, it's the people on the team and you need to build that culture. And, uh, and that's, that's what made us uh, kind of get to the six months <coughs> creative maths. But uh, we, there's no way we could have done that without building the cul culture first. So that's what I have. Thank you. Yeah, question. Which part of the journey was the worst? Recruiting. Uh, no, uh, I think uh, I think we did some some error, some things I would have done different today. Uh, for instance, we waited too long f starting on the Kubernetes and infrastructure part. I, wish I see that it, we we had actually we could have made it on in six months calendar time if we started on that earlier. It took more time than we expected. But I think the. the the worst part for me was to do the learnings along the way here uh, and getting getting that building that culture takes a lot of effort right? yeah, so it's it's you know i haven't coded for one and a half year and that's painful but that's my priority and you know i have to prioritize those uh, building the team instead of kind of building my own skills for and i, I will get back to coding uh but uh, you know right now that's the most important thing so and that's also something we are working on right uh, right now is because now we had kind of onboarded the, the team, but how do you keep them right? Uh, and I don't want to have like, if you work five years, you're a senior. That's no, you're gonna have some. This is what it takes to be a senior in Contali, right? You're gonna have some. You need to know this and this and this this, and it's concrete list of things you should read up on and be good at before we can call you a senior. If that takes you one year, ten year, I don't care. So that's kind of g building up that, and, and you have that kind of ladder you can, can climb, even though it's a really small company, you know, we are 40 people. And I want someone to take that place. I want to be a coder again. I don't want to be a CTO. I want to code. So, nice. <laughs>